Good. Hey, folks. Uh, we've got a. We're already in it, and I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to produce this. But Jake and I are already deep in this and vibing. So you're along for the ride, folks. This is the Wrench Turners podcast, a show completely about the life and well being of uh, mechanics across the globe. And when I say across the globe, I mean across the globe. We have 33 different countries listening to the Wrench Turners podcast. We have almost 10,000 listens on Spotify, almost 100,000 views on YouTube, and countless other views and listens on other platforms that I don't get tracking information on. So there's a whole lot of people listening across the globe. I love all of you and thank you very much for your support. And today we get to talk to another mechanic, which, if my math is correct, is about technician or mechanic number 30. We've had heavy duty, we've had fleet, we've had diesel. We've had automotive, we've had motorcycle all on the show. We've had from the UK, from America, and from Canada. Some of them are foremen, some of them are senior, some of them are even nearly brand new. You probably just watched an episode with a technician that hasn't even been in the trade for a year. And now we have Jake here who's been in the trade for a very long time and is now the foreman at a Toyota store. Ladies and gentlemen, Jake Pratt. Let's get into it. That was a hell of an intro. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. When I when it's flowing, it's flowing. Let's get into this because I, I'm I'm ready to rock. So let's let's do some due diligence here. Let's let's tell the people what got you into the trade first, and then we're gonna dive into the, some of these stories that you promised me. Gotcha. So it was actually in high school. I met a girl, and her father owned a small gas engine shop. Right, he ran it out of his house at first when I first met him, and he needed some help. You know moving stuff around, cleaning up and all that. So that was my job at first. I was with him for like four and a half years. I went from cleaning up to actually working on the stuff. It was from anything but from a a weed whip, a lawnmower, went up to dirt bikes, went up to like um, golf course um, machinery and stuff of that nature too. So like it, it just ranged and just being able to see how all that stuff worked got me into wanting to work on my own car, which brings me into, I got a a 93 Ford F-150 out of high school. Yeah, buddy. (laughs) Yeah, buddy. And it was, it was kind of hammered. It was, it was pretty beat up, but, uh, you know, working high school job, you, you know, save a little money here, put a little money back into it, you know, and working on it on the weekends and stuff. And it was a pretty cool car. All my friends remember that. If I bring that up, we had a lot of memories with that thing, but just tinkering with that made me want to learn more and you know i uh i found uti universal technical institute and right out of high school you know i I went to that i did all my shop classes in in high school and all that stuff too and get further into that later on but yeah the thing that started that off was working on the small stuff and it was really cool to see all that work yeah, the, sometimes the small tough is what you need to learn right off the rip because you, you you know you play with lawnmowers, you play with little tractors, ride on tractors, or whatever the case may may be, and it, it, they're so simple, and yet it doesn't take much to make them not work. And if you've ever pulled apart the carb on a single cylinder anything and look at it and go, "What in God's green earth am I looking at?" and then later on when you start to look at you know, four barrel carbs and you look at motorcycle carb carbs and all this, it's the same stuff. It's right? just it, bigger. It, it's just bigger. <laughs> yep. And that's right? all it's it is. It's just bigger. And then you get, it's like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. This is, this is all right. Yep. Now I, one of my stories going back, one of my first uh, memories of working with my grandfather out in the garage is my grandfather and I working on, we know square body, we had 20 uh, square body, 2,500 Chevy. Big red, we called her. Yeah. And the, the rear box had rotted off of it. So he had built uh, um, a big old wooden, we'll call it a flatbed on the back with sides. Nothing ever went into it. It was just there because it had to be for legal reasons. He just bolted but, it to the frame. Yeah, just basically <laughs> bolted it to the frame, as it were. And uh, it was a plow truck with a you know, blue bulb on the top. And I remember being out in the cold with him. And we pulled the carb off. And I, 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 I can't be that old. I got to be like four, five, six, something like that. Like young, 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 young. And we pulled it off and we're in the garage and he moves this pail over. I didn't know what the pail was at the time. And I didn't realize what the pail was until much, much later in life. We pulled over this pail and it smelled. Oh, yeah. the it was smell. a turbo time. <laughs> and Ollie, no, no. 
No, no, it was no? straight diesel. Oh, he had no. brought diesel home oh. in a in a in a like a five gallon bucket. And what did he do with that carb? He put the coal carb right in the bucket and left it there. Just really? left it there. That's it. And it's like, oh, I just remember just look, just the astonishment because the smell and everything else. And then I remember going back in the shop and I remember him pulling apart after he'd been sitting in there and the smell was absolutely horrible. The tools on the, on the bench and all the parts for the car apart on the bench and just putting it back together with him. I obviously wasn't learning anything. I was that little, but just, just doing that yeah. with him yeah. way back then. And just being in awe of how much fun all those little bits and pieces was now fast forward to about a year and a half ago. When I started doing carbs a whole lot at the power sports store, I was at going, this is not as easy as my grandfather made it look. This is not that easy. There is literally 35 parts that came out of this little thing. And most of them are smaller than my fingernail that I got to figure out where they went. So again, but it's all the same stuff. Uh, yeah. I learned to love magnets and magnet trays, especially working on that stuff. Yeah. Cause like the needles would go missing the floats. Mm -hmm. You make sure you have to, because you'd have that apart, and you're like, okay, I got to put this back together. So now, did you did now? I this is this is one of the things that my the 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 shop owner where I was just at uh, taught me is I would take pictures of everything. I uh, my I phone take pictures of everything. Yeah, is loaded with pictures of everything. <laughs> yeah, serial numbers, whether it be how it looked when it before I took it apart, just to make sure everything's in the same spot. You know, I yeah. love taking pictures. iPhones are are great for that. Love it. And the capacity is getting bigger. So it's now thousands of photos. I know when I do a photo dump, it's usually like four or 5,000 pictures that my wife has to sort through. And it's literally like hundreds of pictures of things that I've taken apart. And then a couple of pictures of her, a couple of pictures of my dog, a couple of pictures of my son out playing soccer or doing something wherever we happen to be. And yeah. then hundreds of pictures of car parts pulled apart or me searching for motorcycles or whatever. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah, my girlfriend was looking through my we were looking through my pictures the other day and yeah, it's just loaded with like, you know, you have to take a picture of every recall you do now too and upload it to, you know, Toyota mm -hmm. or whatever. And yeah, so it's just loaded with different cars and all that stuff. So yeah. yeah and, and to those that are out there complaining about the pictures, guess what? It doesn't matter whether you're what brand, it doesn't matter what brand of manufacturer you're working for. They're all going to picture requirements including power sports, because when we were doing recalls on Polaris, when we were doing the fuel line recalls, we had to take pictures all in. We had to take pictures in steps, right? It was, and it required a certain position of the part on a table, right? They had to, had to have it completely laid out a specific way for the fuel lines, and it had to be at a top down. So we had to get... <laughs> oh, man, did you have to get up on the ladder or what? <laughs> we're growing parts who is five foot nothing had to get up on, the, on on nearly the top rung of the ladder looking down with the with the, the camera to, to anyway i digress i digress so out of high school straight into uti um getting your getting your ticket as it were at uti what was it like at uti you know what i found out about that school is there's a lot of people that complain about it but what I found out later on is you get exactly what you put into that school. So if you were there to learn, you're going to learn, you know, and you can, they'll pass you, you know, with a, a quote unquote C, but you didn't get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. So the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And it helps you later on in life. Immensely, especially if you're right? going, yeah. Oh man. Cause the stuff that it's building blocks. Yeah. You don't learn everything there. But the stuff that you know going into the trade makes your life ten times easier. So, well, that's that's all education that you've probably learned at that point. If you have that mentality going into all of the training, including your brand technical training, your UTI training, and then any training that you're seeking that isn't provided by by either, what you put into it, you'll get out of. So when you're taking notes, when you're asking lots of questions, and this is the thing that I do when when I did the, did the course back in January. I'm going to ask you questions and I'm going to expect answers. It's going to suck because yep. nobody likes volunteering in those kinds of sessions. Nobody does. I don't even like to volunteer in those sessions. It's a, it's a human response. I don't want to be called on. I don't want to be singled out. But guess what happens when you get when you are active persistent in your own education, not only do you get more out of it, you get exponentially more out of it because now you're associating emotion with education. And when you associate ed emotion with education, you don't forget it, especially if you're getting it in all three ways that you can learn 
tactile, visual, and audio. If you're getting all three of those and you're attaching an emotion to it, you ain't going to forget nothing. And it's awesome because then you can apply it to everything. It's just, it's just awesome that way. So you've been putting a whole lot into UTI and you came out of there. What was that first year like of working? Now that you've got this education, you got into it. Did you get into a dealership first? Did you get an independent first? How did that, how did that transition for you? So while I was going to UTI, I was working at um, so, uh, something we call down here, Farm and Fleet. They have a service center um, where you, it was like a, a tire break and suspension shop. So I was kind of getting my hands dirty there. I did a lot of tires there, so I'm really good at those. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you just kind of get to see all makes and models. And some of the cars were in better shape than others. Obviously, you could see some pretty old stuff there. Or like when they bring in a Bobcat tire and they're like, you know, it's a 10 mm -hmm. foot tire and you got to take it off of the car tire machine. You're like, uh, you're looking at them like, there's no fucking way that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, you get four or five guys on that tire machine and guess what? It's on there. It's going on. So, yep. um, so yeah, I did that. And then, uh, I left there, what, January of 2016, I believe. Yeah. Our Toyota store was just a year old and, uh, I started there at, um, Toyota at the dealership. So I actually, one of the guys that I was going to class with had just gotten a job and he, uh, he recommended me in to go talk to the director at the time. So mm -hmm. yeah, we got in and that was probably one of the easiest hiring experiences. I, I sat down with my UTI piece of paper. I slid it across the, you know, the desk. He, he looked at me. He's like, when can you start? Because <laughs> I had T pat and all that stuff. I, you know, like it, it was, it probably looked really good to him at the time, you know, like we can work with this kid. <laughs> Excellent. So, Excellent. Yeah. See, sometimes, sometimes the training in the school really does pay off and it's like, it's that easy. Yeah. Which is really cool. cool. So, uh, yeah. And obviously we did TXM, which is our express maintenance and stuff in school. So mm -hmm. like taking that and, you know, flipping it into the dealership setting, it was easy. It just, it wasn't the same, you know, clip car. It was an actual mm -hmm. customer car. So, yeah, it was it was pretty nice and easy to get into. Nice. Nice. So okay, so here's here's the rub here. So this is where so you you were you were doing bobcat tires. You, you were doing <laughs> bobcat tires. Let's let's be real here. Yep. So your first experience in the dealership was it any different? Like did you did you have to, you know, shovel shit as it were as that first year in the dealership or did you get right into it and into the thick of it fixing stuff? So I, it was just strictly oil change rotates, like maybe the occasional air filter here or there. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so it was like that for about a year and a half. Um, I got really good at oil changes, but at, mm -hmm. at first I, I can say to you, I was terrified going into the dealership <laughs> setting. I was scared. Like you get done with the day and this probably happened. It happens to everybody. I'm sure you're on your way home and you're like, did I tighten that drain plug? Even though yep. you have like the, the torque wrench, you know, that's got the spec <laughs> to it. And you, uh -huh. You're clicking every single one of them, but it's so monotonous that you're like, man, did I, did I tighten that lug nut? Did I torque those wheels? You know, you just, you do those, those weird checks at the end of the day. So yeah, yeah. It, it took me a while. It, doesn't not, it does not go away either. Right. After <sighs> no, it years, doesn't. You, you said you moved to, tra moved to Toyota in 2016. So you're on eight years, give or take in a dealership setting. I don't, I don't know whether you're at the same store or not. It doesn't matter. But eight years in a dealership setting, it does not go away. No. It doesn't matter. The, I was doing it today. Part, <laughs> so. The best part about being in a dealership, though, after that period of time, and once you transition to not doing old changes every single minute of the day, is is you go from it being a potential complacent error to a you haven't done it in so long. It's a, wait a minute. I haven't done an old change in three weeks because I've been doing engines or I've been doing transmissions or whatever. Okay, these are the tools that I need. This is what this is. The, da, 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 da. You're running through the checklist in your head. It's okay. I did that. I did that. It's like, did I do the drain plug? Yep. Did I do the drain plug? Okay. Yep. I know I did the drain plug. Did I do the drain plug? And it and it's like for 48 hours. You did, and that's all it takes is one thought. It's 48 hours, and it's like, did I do the drain plug? Please, for the love of God. And at 48 hours, if you didn't do the drain plug at 48 hours, it'd be back on the hook by now. And and that's the thing is, uh, I used to do that when I turned to like a, we call it a semi-skilled technician. It was just before apprentice where he did a lot of fluid flushes and stuff. I used mm -hmm. to just drive around the lot when I got there, get there five minutes early and just take a look to see if there's any cars that I'd worked on the day before, before <laughs> I walked in, you know, to mentally prepare, you know, 
Like, let's see. You might see what I'm walking If you can into. mentally prepare for your day like that, though, that's 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 a coping mechanism. These are the things that we need to to share with other techs, right? Because these yeah. are the things that we learn over time to say, hey, it's okay to feel this way. Like, it's it's human nature. You're not perfect, which means you're never going to be perfect, which means you're going to make a mistake. You're going to make a mistake. It's it's inevitable. And how big human. that mistake is. What's the what's the phrase? Um, you don't. Uh, you I don't. How does, oh, I really wish I could get this out succinctly because then I would sound really intelligent. And right now I'm. You are really intelligent. No, off. you got this. It'll come so to you. <laughs> it's you. You don't. You don't surpass your greatest expectations. You fall to your greatest level of uh, uh, greatest level of training, and um, or you know I've heard it. Greatest level of training, greatest level of preparedness, greatest level, greatest level of process. Either way, it's whatever your lowest thing is, whether it's training, processes, or whatever the case may be. Whatever your lowest on the rung of whatever it is you feel you have, that's where you fall to. It's not where you jump, it's where you fall to. So if you don't, if you find yourself constantly making mistakes, you don't have enough processes in place, or you haven't learned enough things, or you haven't done enough things, or you haven't talked to enough people. Something in that mix needs to upgrade to try and remove the mistakes and as you go on it's and one of the things that it's a hard nut to swallow <laughs> as a technician but it's more about removing negative than it is about adding positive because in reality what we do every day is really awesome we take it's something incredible. that's broken yep and, and we we pump it out and all of a sudden it works and we get families to go you know be safe get to and from and all those kinds of things and and this really complicated machine goes from broken to working again that's really awesome that's really awesome it's so all of the other cool. all the rest of stuff is just removing the negative so the more negative you can remove the more successful you're going to be as a mechanic for sure i found that in the shop too that's that's actually pretty powerful as a saying just the less negative things you have going around the shop, the, the better mm -hmm. the, the morale is. And it, the, the banter is a lot of fun too, you know, just mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody, we're, we're all here doing a job to provide for our families. Let's just try mm -hmm. to make it a little bit more fun for everybody. You know, we're all, we got to be here. We're stuck here. Might as well just make it fun for everybody. So we spend what? 75% of our lives working. So the last thing you want to do is make 75% of your life awful. Miserable. So, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. No, that's why I preach fit's so important, right? You got to fit with the people that are around you because if you can't stand the people around you, you're going to be there for eight, 10, 12 hours a day, three, four, five days a week, six days a week sometimes. Like, you got to enjoy where you're at. And the people around you got to be supportive. You got to be part of the team. You got to work with the team, and the team's got to support you. If that doesn't happen. You need to get out. You need to find people who are due. So, yeah. I, so that said, been to UDI. You were at a smaller, smaller facility. Then you moved to the dealership. You're growing in the dealership. What's happened between then and now? Oh, a lot of learning. Um, a lot of... So my philosophy was you kind of got to mess up a little bit to learn. So um, obviously smaller mess ups at, at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> but like I've always attributed things that I've messed up to I'll never do that again. Um, mm -hmm. And if I don't know something, I am not afraid to ask. And that's the one thing that I would tell. That's why I tell some of the semi-skills and apprentices now, like, if you don't know, there's, you know, 12 other guys here that do know. And if I don't know, we're going to figure it out together. So mm -hmm. and that's, that, that's pretty huge. But there's been a lot of learning. Um, I from like my first engine rebuild, my first transmission, you know, doing like my first remain seal or um, doing like my first big electrical diag, you know, it all sets you up for things later on in life that you're going to do inside work and outside work. So um, I just, you, you get a car in your stall now, because I'm at the point now where I've, I've been there for a while, you get a car in there and you already kind of know what you're looking at or what you're going to get with the car mm -hmm. which is really cool um i guess it, it could be a, a a bad thing too because we as a, a dealership specific group you kind of get lazy i don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever noticed that because mm -hmm. you, you see the same motor the same transmission the same problems you know oh there's a tsb for that or you know there's a recall for that or you know it, i think it has made me kind of complacent so i think for me i'm a data nerd 
So I love plugging things into spreadsheets and I make, I, I, I turn everything into a spreadsheet if I can, because it's a, a really easy way for me to quantify stuff. And as a technician, I would quantify everything that I did. So for me, I beat the complacency with trying to beat my times like a competitive runner. Right. I, I, so I would, I would plug, I would plug all of my data in. I, 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 unfortunately the, the laptop that all of that information was still on died and oh, it died, no. died. So I couldn't recover any of it because it was before Google cloud and everything else like that. So it died, died and all of that, that I went with it, but I had two full years of my Dodge data. So while I was turning, turning wrenches flat rate for a Dodge dealer in, in the city, I had all of that information, every work order, every line on the work order. I had all of my hours build hours worked across the board for two solid years in a spreadsheet form. So I could see my Delta between jobs, right? About four months ago, I did the same report repair and I did it in 1.8. And today I did it in 1.7 without thinking about it because effectively I'm not thinking about it. So essentially what I did is I just put another six minutes in my pocket, right? So now going wow. forward, okay, I can go back. I know that I've done that a couple of times. And, and that's where I came up with my, one of my rules is that my rule of six, just about across the board, it takes six times before you meet the flat rate time or be at least within 15% of that flat rate time because I use my own. This is where sometimes a lot of mechanics get, get screwed up is even if you take something as simple as brakes, if you haven't done brakes on that car, on that model, on that layout, it's six times for that car, that model, that layout. Period. So you're across probably going to lose a little bit on something that you've never done before, which makes total exactly. sense. But you, but you build that, if you can build that into your mindset going forward as you learn, because what we are functionally as mechanics, we don't go to school to get pounded with education like most professions do. Doctors, lawyers, so on and so forth. They get pounded with education over and over and over and over and over and over again. And they do, uh, like my wife, a chiropractor, she did clinic. So she was pounded with the same information over and over in school. We aren't, we don't get that opportunity because it's constantly evolving constantly. It's little nuances that changes change going forward. The human body hasn't changed in 200 years. It's yeah. just a shit ton of <laughs> shit to learn for them. The yep. difference is there's a lot for us to learn, but it's constantly evolving. So as we go forward, we write those things down and that's how we learn going forward. So our payment to our education is the time that, it, that we lose on the repair. When, when you say that, yeah, thinking about like, because we have the new Tundra fuel line recall, mm -hmm. the first tank you drop, you're making the, I think they paid us 2.1 hours for that. And you look at the 2.1, you're like, that is some bullshit time to drop a tank, mm -hmm. a 38 gallon tank, you know? And you're like, this is stupid to, you know, inspect the line to put it back up or to put the, the fuel line tape on there and stuff. But now that you think about it, I can have one of those down, you know, hopefully nobody. In, in Toyota region or Toyota land, here's me saying this, but yeah, you can get, have it done in like 20 minutes, you know, which is yeah, incredible. It's, it's only a matter of time until they chop it anyway. Cause if you can do it yeah, in 20 minutes, yeah. more than likely there's a thousand other, te other Toyota technicians that are doing it in 20 minutes. And it's only a matter of time that's going to get chopped. So it's just, it is what it is. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. But functionally yeah. speaking, you probably lost your time on the first two, three, maybe even four times for sure. You may, by four, you're close. Four, five, you're close. Six, you should be breaking even. Well, there's a little orange clip on one of the charcoal canister lines mm -hmm. that uh, over time gets brittle. But uh, so you got to be really careful with it. And if you break that clip, you need the whole tank. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't know that. And there was, I had a uh, Tundra. It had about 65K on it. And it was one of the first Tundras that were rolled out. And uh, I broke that clip. And I got That's on the phone. That's 65,000 miles, Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got on the phone with our FTS. And I said, hey, man. I was like, I fucked up. I was like, please tell me you guys sell this clip separately. Because there's no way that it's a whole tank. Because I'd already went to my parts department and said, hey, this is what I did. And uh, he goes, no, man. That's a whole tank. He said, that sucks. But here's one thing. He's like, I bet you won't do that again. <laughs> I was like, no, I won't. But yeah, so I had to as, take as you as you prefaced all of these stories thus far with the things that I learned, so I never have never do it again. <laughs> I will never, ever, ever break one of those clips again. But I was just it's one of those those ones with the ears on it. And as oh, I was yeah. prying up the middle, the one ear caught and it just that was it. Just came over and it cracked in half. And I was like, <laughs> You just look Didn't at now here's the thing. Did it make the noise? Did it make the cracking noise? Did you get warning? Did it go 
did, did it make? I can't even replicate it with my mouth. But it was like make that subtle crack. Yeah, yeah and that it's plastic like, crack. Instantaneously, it's. I already know it's done. No, I already it's know. A, it's done. Yeah, my my pick. Like I thought my pick slipped off of the clip. I was like, so I like looked inside there, and all of a sudden I see one piece of the orange clip on top of the tank, and then the other one over by the frame rail. I was like, no fucking uh, way. Uh, I like my heart just sank and I like looked over at the technician next to me and he goes, what'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I broke that orange clip. He goes, what? Yeah. So that was, yeah. <sighs> yeah. You know what it, it, and those aren't even really, I wouldn't even say that sometimes those things are, are things we can avoid because there is a line I would suggest in the sand that if it's going to break, it's probably going to break no matter what you do. Yep. Yeah. And there really isn't a whole lot of preparation you can do because it's usually the the moments where you say that's gonna that's not gonna break that'll be fine and of course it breaks right because there's a certain degree of variability in there that you just have no idea you have no idea what kind of life that a tiny little clip has lived because that tiny little clip could have been on a shelf for fifteen years and they go oh this will go in this just nicely brand new in its little package and now it's into an assembly oh we'll sell this as an assembly to get rid of all of these clips awesome that's great for our gross profit you know we paid we paid the two cents a piece for these things back in 1991 and now they're going on a 2020 2020 tundra yeah right which it makes sense because yeah if you look at some of the clips they're all different colors they're like a different hue of orange it could be orange red whatever I got into a fight with right. another technician i was like yeah i broke that orange clip he's like you mean the red one I was like, what? Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> orange. <laughs> it's orange, not red. No, he's like, dude, I was red. I was like, oh, good. <laughs> now, so. this, is, this, is, this is outside automotive for a second. And, and the reason why I bring it up is go, thinking on the concept of having a clip built in like 1991 and sitting on the shelf and all of a sudden Toyota uses it for these fuel charcoal canisters or what have you. Somebody made, made a comment about Suzuki not having any new motorcycles. They've had new motorcycles, but they haven't really had any new motorcycles in a really long time. And this story is kind of relevant coming up here in a minute. Okay, but, I'm, I'm following uh, along, man. I'm, 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 follow, <laughs> follow along, bear with me for a second, because yep. sometimes the rabbit holes go deep and i got to dig myself out of it. But <laughs> Suzuki hasn't really built a new bike in a very long time. Just, you know, the Jixus 1000, the Jixus 750, 600, it's basically the same thing for forever. It's basically the same motor it's been for forever with minor tweaks and so on and so forth. And and somebody's going along the lines of they just really haven't come up with the times. They haven't come into 2024 and whatever, whatever, whatever. And they released the, the uh, Jixus 8S or whatever it is recently. And it's actually all new. It's completely new in, in every way. And it's like, well, why hasn't Suzuki done this for, for ages? It was like, obviously, you don't understand business functionally. Because if a company that size can produce a motorcycle for that long, Without really changing anything, can you imagine the margins? Think about the margins of profit that a company that size producing a bike across the planet, selling thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of these things without actually having to change anything. It's not broke. Don't fix it. Exactly. <laughs> and As that's a mechanic. A <laughs> yes, As please. As a mechanic, don't what would I rather it. work on? Would I rather work on a, a Corolla that's been produced since 2000 it's functionally the same thing for like 15 years or whatever it is if it's not broke don't fix it and guess what happens when you have something that is that has been that long in the tooth all of the parts are cheap which means people come back to fix them yep and that's it's the bread, that's the bread and butter <laughs> so it's easy to fix yep so that's why and this is all the back background because my thought was the corolla because somebody um mighty car mods just did a uh we just made a thousand dollars an hour thing clip on YouTube. And it was on a, on a older styling. It was like a 20, I want to say it was a 2015, maybe even older Corolla where they did a fix and flip in three hours. Mark or Moog did. And it was a whole thing that I just watched. And I what just, they do? Wow. just put a head gasket in the thing and ship it back out the door. Or what? Yeah. <laughs> well, they, actually, no, it looked like it was in good shape. Otherwise, but the outside looked like absolute trash. They cleaned everything up. They buffed everything up. They painted the, the, they painted the, the color match, the door handles, because they were black. The color match, the mirrors, because they were black. Uh, they cleaned the car inside and out, fixed a leak, and then resold it for like $3,000 worth of profit. Good so, stuff, man. That's awesome. Like, good for them. <laughs> really speaking, a little bit of paint, a little bit of, little bit of spit shine, and she's good to go at the door. So 
it's amazing what you can do when you look at something and I'm beating my head against, I'm calling engineering, I'm talking to my buddies, I'm talking to my baymate, I'm talking to the boss, talking to the foreman, trying to figure this out because it's so complicated. Da, da, da. And yet the guy beside him is doing a set of brakes on a Corolla. Making tons of money, <laughs> which we love that. Just yeah. Money. Yep. It's the boring shit. The grocery it's getter stuff. The boring shit. Yep. Getting grabbed right. to the grocery store. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the stuff. <laughs> exactly. So what would you say? And then, so let's, let's talk about something complicated for a second. What is the most challenging repair that you've done in the last eight years? I've had a couple that have stumped me and stumped a lot of people in the shop. And uh, I guess I got to go with the one that just it was more recent. It was a Grand Highlander, a 2023 Grand Highlander Platinum. It's a beautiful car. And it, w- it had a, um, a vent valve code for the fuel tank. Um, oh, take me back to Corolla, my God. <laughs> <dude>. <laughs> right? Well, it's, they, they changed it to a stepper motor. So it's like a two stage motor. So like, obviously a stepper motor one, they, they like power it one side and the other, and it, it moves it open and closed. Right. Can't just have, mm-hmm. you know, it can't be like a purge valve or it's just powered on, powered off. No, we have, we have to be able to, you know, stepper motor this thing. And, um, so they ended up, um, it ended up having that code and I tested the, the, um, the valve itself, everything was fine. Uh, tested the wiring from the ECU to the valve. That was okay. Um, we had, so this is where the kicker comes in. We had the pin fit gauge for the connector on the actual valve side. We didn't have the ECU um, pin fit gauge, so I couldn't test the pin fit on the ECU side. Mm. Engineering came out our FTS came out and we found out if we popped the fuel door, right? Like it was getting ready to refuel, which would, you know, open and close the vent valve um, mm-hmm. and drive the car like five miles, the code would come back on. So since the valve was good, we changed the valve. We tested the wiring um, for the most part. Um, and then uh, we, we were able to duplicate it. We thought it was a control side. Our engineer thought it was control side. So I thought it was an ECU. So we put the ECU in it car leaves for like three months which was awesome i was like cool we fixed this car we, we couldn't get it to duplicate it or whatever well, it comes back so this is the third time it's back um and we i i obviously downloaded all the codes and everything and i uh got the freeze frame out and then we cleared the codes and tried to duplicate the concern we put like 350 miles on this car i drove it home twice a couple other guys drove it home. We couldn't get it to duplicate. And the only thing that we can come up with, because there's a buyback car, we're still waiting to see what we're going to do with it. But the only thing that logically makes sense to me is pin fit on that ECU. Because that's the only time I ever messed with, you know, putting in a new ECU. It mm-hmm. just sounds like pin fit there. So we even tried swapping because there's a, like an A side to B side to that stepper motor. We tried mm-hmm. just switching the wires on the mm-hmm. ECU side and on the, um, valve side and we just couldn't get it to come back so i think while i was messing with the ecu uh connector that the pin fit came back so it was just one of those cars where like no matter what you did you know you couldn't figure out what was wrong with it because it was so intermittent so yeah those are those are the ones that that chaff really bad like they 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 chaff so bad because especially when you don't get to come to a, a an answer like the the ocd in me goes so what was the answer? Yeah, what was wrong with that and, car? I need to know. You still don't know because just the way the circumstances run. Yeah. Like it's it sucks. The customer experience will have been horrible. They they will have had an awful time. I can only imagine the conversations that the customer had. I can only imagine what the, the director or the service manager will have had the, with the customer trying to figure out what's going on, trying to make mitigate all of this. And it's really nobody's fault in that circumstances. In, in like, well, it's everybody's fault, it's nobody's fault, right? It in that circumstance. Yeah. You've got something that's wrong. But it's so bloody intermittent that it's like three months, three months. Yeah, that's why I was like, <laughs> and then you see it back. And you're like, it's Wait one thing a minute. to say it happens maybe every, every once a week, you know, every couple of days. That in itself is hard enough to, to try and say to, to duplicate. But three months. Oh, my goodness. That's why. So it, yeah. to say the least. That was tough. OK, well, that that's that's a kind of a challenge. So what did you. When you come across stuff like that, and this leads us in the last question, 
It's like, what would be your piece of advice for a technician to be happier, healthier, more productive tomorrow? Because I think that's a great, great way to lead into that. I think being up to date on your training, knowing the new systems and how they work definitely helped me look at the way that system worked to kind of see where I should look first. Um, and one of the other technicians there, uh, Tim, he's great. He throws me into the repair manual and all the stuff that's highlighted or in different colors. And he's like, that's the important stuff. Read that, read how it works. So I would recommend that. So training for one, uh, two, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, make sure you bounce all those ideas off of everybody. Like, this is what I got. This is how far I'm into this. Do you have anything else that I might be missing? You know, just ask that question. Because if you don't, then that's where you, you know, run into, you know, you got to go call engineering and all that stuff. But just to, you know, mark your, your P's and Q's on that. But um, it, it really just boils down to training, I think. Training and don't be afraid to ask questions. Because there's the only stupid question is the one not asked, I think, in, in the grand scheme of things. Is that Thank you for that, that, the question, that is, man. That is my, my, one of my favorite things of all time is there is no – the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Yep. That's it. And the, the question you don't ask is going to get you into more trouble than all of the questions you can ask. Even just the, the kids on the way up, like sometimes they're afraid to come ask us because we look busy. And I reiterate as I'm walking by, like I would rather you ask me and bother me than to mess that car up because then if you mess it up, then I have to fix it. <laughs> and if we my can... only cap got to that for those technicians that are listening and to you, Jake, is I want those questions asked. However, it can't you be the same in, question multiple a, times. It can't be the same question. Yep. B, if you haven't done anything yet, oh, I ain't yeah. saying anything because the first question out of the first thing out of my mouth is i'm not answering the question right away i'm gonna ask a whole bunch of questions myself have you done this 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 have you done it like i'll rattle off all the things that i know that need to be done first before that question gets answered if you haven't done even half of those guess who gets to walk away and get those things done before you come back then i will answer your question i will happily answer that question and i will tell you why not just answer the question. I will tell you why we do these things. Yep. And then hopefully by you doing all the things that you were supposed to do first, you probably already get the answer yourself. They normally do. They normally figure <laughs> it out. And it's great. My, my favorite thing is, have you looked at the repair manual? <laughs> just read through it. Just read through it for me real quick. You know, just to see if it throws you in any sort of direction. You know, just to kind of just check the boxes. That's, that's all I'm asking. So. Now, but how it, often... Do, do the apprentices in your shop, are, are they actually asking you a ton of questions or is it now sparse? No, it's, uh, they're still asking me and um, the MDT at our shop, Tim. Mm -hmm. They they bug him a lot. They started to come over to me because I, I always tell him like, hey, leave him alone. He's busy. because <laughs> <You know>? He's <laughs> such a nice guy. He'll go over and anybody's got a question, he'll help out, you know. Um, is but, he the yeah. guy that needs the? Is, is he the guy that needs the sign on his back? Do, do not disturb. He will talk your ear off. No, he he'll just help you. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll like start to explain him like an issue, and he's All like, right. dude. He grabs his flashlight. He's like, let's go take a look. And I'm like, I love you for that, Tim. But dude, you got stuff that you're trying to do over here. He's like, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's whatever. Because that happened tonight. I had a two hundred and like forty seven thousand mile FJ Cruiser. And uh, it had a check engine light. The drive belt, like half of it was missing. Like it was like split down the middle. And it was like pouring oil from every seal surface. So like where the camshaft position sensors were in the valve cover, you could just see mm -hmm. oil being pushed out, right? And I was like, I walked up to him like, hey, I think I see a PCV system failure. Because we were just talking about like we do PCV uh -huh. systems as maintenance, but this guy, I don't think did. And he's like, no way. He's he was like working on a Tacoma and he like he grabs his flash and he's like, let's go take a look, man. <laughs> and he just we're just messing with like pulling vacuum lines off, pulling off the PCV hose, or like pulling the oil cap off to see if it's got vacuum and stuff, just playing around. But yeah, so he's really cool with that stuff. But it's so cool to see some of that stuff too, before it like before you have a full failure of some description where something has gone completely sideways and blown up something, but it's like right on that teetering edge where you can see it failing, but it's not doing 
monstrous damage like you've blown a motor or something stupid like that 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 kind of stuff is really cool to see because you don't get to see it often because usually usually a customer will have driven the absolute piss out of something and blown it up on the highway and now you've got pieces of engine hanging everywhere it's like i got a hole dear liza a hole and it's in the side of the block yeah. Right. Because that's that kind of stuff happens and we don't get to see the in between. And it's we recommend something we re- more than likely. He's been told that he needs to change the PCV probably at least a dozen times by this time. I'm, stage, I'm right? sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, Two hundred and forty seven thousand miles. My goodness. That's not that's that that's that's quite a few. That's quite a few. Just Honestly, listening to the oil true. pump, man. Yeah. Just listen to the oil pump. Just like gasping and, and like it sounds like wispy almost. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound good. But yeah, that I lifted that car up on the lift. I'm like, because the frames are kind of shit on those Forerunners, Tacomas, Tundras, whatever. I like, it looked pretty solid, and I started to lift it, and all of a sudden you hear that crack crunch, and you're like, okay, maybe not. We're just going to put that back down on the ground. <laughs> you know, leave that yeah. up in here. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if you guys I, use I'm... salt up in Canada or not, but... Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, the Midwest oh, is, yes. is really good with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, when, when you see... Um... I, not that long ago, I'm, I'm fairly confident it was my memory. If my memory serves, it was maybe not this past winter, but the winter before I saw a Chevy sitting oh, in the V yeah, the, when, the... when the box is laying against the cab, that's bad. And when you can see the frame underneath and you can see the split underneath and it def- and it looks like it's folded. It's no longer just that you can see a split. It's that it's folded in on itself because of the weight, the way it goes. That's bad. And to think, Somebody's actively driving that. And what happens if they hit the brakes too hard? Guess what? She's doing the accordion. Yep. And guess what? I don't want to be anywhere near that. I think uh, mandated safety inspections would be a kick-ass idea. Just because yes. you, ne- you don't know who you're driving next to, what they've done to that car. You don't know if that thing's safe. Uh, it's just nope. a scary thought. Nope. I don't understand why it's at the commercial level only. I really yeah, don't. I don't understand why it's at the commercial level only because the whole point of, of I think more than anything, it's at the commercial level for to, as a money grab more than anything. But yeah. you know, there's a line in the sand. If it's a commercial vehicle, they get the, the trucks get checked all the way down to a certain, certain point. And you know what? If an 18 wheeler is doing 18 hours of driving a day, every day, it's putting the miles on, putting on miles on. And it's all about fractional profits, like per cost per miles and things of that nature. It makes sense not to fix a truck. It makes sense. You've got, you know, all those wheels, all those tires and all it's like, ah, if one fails, it's not a big deal. They got 10 more to go. Well, from a, <laughs> from a business perspective, it doesn't make, if you, you spend the least amount of money that you possibly can to function and make a profit. Awesome. Well, that, that hurts people. Like that's safety. Purely and simply, you're now affecting safety as a, as a long term of the population. But when you have four wheels out in the road and you've got something that's completely rotten in the frame and some of the stuff that I'm sure that you've seen that I've seen, you know, when, when you've got a, a pair of vice grips holding tie rods on and you've got or zip, zip ties, ties and holding duct tape, man. zip ties as springs, yep. right? Trying zip to, ties. to turning, turning a split spring into one piece again. Oh my goodness. JB welded gas tanks and stuff. You just like, wait a minute. Or like the gas tank straps missing. So they use a bungee instead. Oh my God. <laughs> that like, too. What are we doing? It's just, it's, it's what so doing? scary. Yeah. It's so scary to see that stuff out in the road, but it's, it's out. It's people out in the road. It's like, I don't, I can't afford to fix it or they're just cheap and they don't want to fix it. I it's know true. if my dad's listening right now, you are the cheapest person on the road. You are the cheapest person on the road that I know. I know it. Um, but at the end of the day, he'll buy a car and he'll go out and he'll sell the car when it costs too much money to fix. And he'll just buy the next car and somebody else's problem. That's okay. That's his way of doing things. And I support you in your choices. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah. so I digress. I don't I support my dad in that. I he just throws me the keys and says, "Please, just whatever it needs." He doesn't want to have to worry <laughs> about it. So, yeah, I love him for that because that makes my job easy. Like, hey, here's the bill at the end. <laughs> Does he drive a Toyota too? Yeah, he drives a 21 Tundra. He actually just took nice. it. Well, I think was it across 15 states? They were left uh, in late February and just made it back in early May. So, yeah, I think what two days cool. ago they got back. Yeah, that thing. It got beat, but so it needs tires. You got a lot now. to fix then. <laughs> oh, up? yeah. Big, you got a lot to fix now then. Oh, yeah. 
tires, brakes, all that. Because he went through the mountains and he torched the brakes on that thing too. So it's going to be, it'll be time. So I can't believe how many people don't understand how to drive through mountains. And like we've got, a, oh, it, it's, 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 you would probably know better than anyone. I don't know where you're located in Canada, but I would imagine you've probably had your fair share. Well, we live, uh, at, okay. So I live in Wasega beach Okay. and Wasega beach is the largest freshwater beach in the world. 15 miles of beach, freshwater. That sounds incredible. Does and it look really cool too? Is it that cool blue color? Really cool. Yeah. We're, we're, if, if you can, if you can picture it, let me get the, get it in the camera here properly. We are. So this is Georgian Bay. If you think like this, this is Georgian Bay. And for some reason, it's escaping me right now. But right here is like a, a great lake. I think it's Superior, I think, whatever. So uh, Georgian Bay is fed by Lake Superior. So we've got this big old horseshoe. And we're at the very bottom of the horseshoe in Wasega Beach. So basically, the, the bottom up towards the right side is all freshwater beach. And it goes across a whole bunch of different municipalities. But it's effectively one long beach. Okay. If you go roughly 10 miles to the west is Blue Mountain, which is the largest mountain range in Ontario. So there are seven ski hills, give or take. Now they're ski hills. I use air quotes for those that are those of you that are, that are listening. It's ski hills. It's relatively small. If you think ski hill, you're thinking like Banff. You're thinking yeah, the Rocky Mountain. Going like you're thinking BC area, you Utah know. and BC and things of yeah. that nature where they're huge. Like it's 20 minutes down the hill as as a, a, on skis or a snowboard. I'm down the hill in about 45 seconds, right? 45 seconds, maybe a minute tops. Small hill. Enough to but have fun, you know. Lots of mountain. And, they're, and, and the road up to the top of the mountain is called Scenic Caves Road because there's also cool, cool thing. There's caves in the mountains. Cool. But it, so it's called Scenic Caves. But it's got the S-bend all down the mountain. And it is down the mountain. And there's lots of people who live on top of the hill. And there's lots of people that kind of have to come down up and torch brakes. Yeah, Absolutely just coming down. The, yeah, let's engine brake a little bit. Just a little. Like, even automatics have the ability to tuck it down into third. Tuck it down into low. It doesn't matter. Let, it, let the engine rev. It's not going to hurt to let the engine rev. Don't let it over rev, obviously. It's not going to let you do that. But let the engine rev. Let Use the engine brake. And my God, people, please, please, please. Please let the engine do in some braking because you're just going to completely destroy the brakes. And I remember working at the Toyota store when I was working back at the Toyota store. We'd be doing warp brakes for people that lived on top of the hill. Yep. Absolutely murdering these rotors. Murdering the rotors. Oh, they sing it again. It's like, okay, how many times have you been down the mountain, Mrs. Smith? Yeah, we can't, oh, can't warranty that, that again because you, you did that. <laughs> I have to ask Break. you a question, though. Hopefully you Shoot. don't mind me asking you a couple questions. What, Shoot. Obviously, you've worked for a couple different manufacturers what was your favorite mm -hmm. manufacturer to work for Toyota. so thank god okay cool so i made hands a good down. decision <laughs> my hands down yeah i worked for i i've i've turned officially professionally turned wrenches for chrysler I'm and sorry. toyota <laughs> yes oh my yes goodness. yes okay so i professionally turned wrenches for chrysler and toyota i did a stint at a body shop which was the biggest mistake i ever made um, and then I came off the bench. I was a service advisor at a Chrysler store. Um, I then did uh, tower slash warranty at the flagship Mercedes-Benz store here in Canada, which is um, at the time was uh, Midtown Mercedes. So at the time, that was a complete eye opener because both the Chrysler store uh, and the Toyota store and the body shop were relatively small in comparison. We're talking no more than maybe 12, 12 total technicians on the floor, 12, 14, somewhere in there. Yeah, and then you go awful. to a store with 25 technicians at the Mercedes, but it's Mercedes. So not only have you doubled the technicians, you basically doubled the revenue. So I walked into a store uh, as Tower that did between a million and a million and a half a month. And this is 2013. Holy give or take. smokes. Goodness. So, right. And that's only with, with 25 techs. Right? That's incredible. I've got, I've got service director friends and I've got uh, fixed ops director friends now that are operating import and domestic stores with anywhere from 30 to 45 technicians doing a million a month. So you look at the difference in income, right? A Mercedes yeah. store 10 years ago with 25 doing a million, million and a half a month to stores now 10 years later with almost twice the number of technicians doing a million and a half a month. The money difference is huge, huge. So for contextually for, I don't think I've ever talked about this in depth and thank you for asking the question. I really appreciate I, I, it. I would like to know more about you, honestly, because so, yeah, so continue on, please. 
Awesome. We'll do. So Mercedes is interesting because going from, from, uh, on the bench, I didn't really, even though the period of time was like almost two years at the Toyota store, I didn't really grasp the menu. Like I didn't understand menu. I didn't grasp menu, the, like the ABCD thing. I didn't really truly grasp because I didn't get involved with it a lot. And there was no menu like that because domestics have no bloody clue how much easier A, B, C, and D makes everybody's lives easier. A is an old change. B is old change tire rotation. C is old change tire rotation and probably alignment or brake service. And D is all of the above, usually with transmission service. Can I stop or right there real quick? Thing. Honda. Honda's A, A number, B number, mm-hmm. C number mm-hmm. service. The customer mm-hmm. drives in, says, there's this light on my dash. And then the mm-hmm. service advisor goes, it's this right here. This is the one you need. Yes. And then they go, uh-huh. okay. Uh-huh. They made that like incredibly easy for the customer and the service advisor to be like, this is what your car needs. Done. Exactly. We need that. Exactly. <laughs> and the domestics, even after all of this time, still haven't grasped that. Oh, that's still annoying. haven't grasped that. The Europeans have, because it's effectively the same thing. It's a there's slight nuance difference between them, but the, the Europeans have, and because we're here in North America, it's luxury here. It's not domestic product. Mercedes, Audi, BMW, we're luxury here. To them, it's just domestic product, yep. right? Completely different. But they have a whole slew of other brands that we don't see, sort of, right? Because Skoda's over there, but that's effectively just a Volkswagen, right? It's, it's things are different. Anyway, I digress. Go that's backtrack cool. here. Yeah. When you see, when you get used to like, thousand dollar seven hundred dollar five hundred dollar repairs in import and domestic world from both technician standpoint and service advisor standpoint it's really hard to wrap your head around fifteen hundred dollar twenty five hundred dollar five thousand dollar eight thousand dollar repairs regularly on mercedes it's difficult to completely wrap your head around it and i give you uh, uh i give you example here so this is going back to Mercedes days. This is going back about a decade, give or take. I can't remember exactly what year I was I was with, what years I was with uh, uh, Mercedes, but I think it's somewhere like 2013 to 2016, somewhere in that range. Because uh, I remember the day I took the job from Mercedes is the same day I found out my wife was pregnant. Oh, it was surprise. it was a very very emotional day. Yeah, I bet. So, <laughs> um, once I was working for Mercedes for a while, I come to grasp uh, for those of you that know the GL. So it's their big SUV and back in it's lots of things have changed over a period of time, but I digress. So the GL was a very high leased vehicle, high volume of sales were leased. Very few were bought. Mostly was leased. So when a GL will come in for its D service, so it's 60,000 kilometer. So it's fourth service. So here in Canada at the time, and I think to this date, I think it's even grown even more, but the GLs were every 15,000 kilometers, roughly every 10,000 miles. So that, and that was the end of their warranty period or thereabouts. So GLs would regularly come in at 58,000, 59,000 kilometers, 60,000 kilometers. So just before the 48,000 miles come in for their D service. So that's oil change, tire rotation, uh, brake fluid, uh, transmission service, um, and check over the vehicle. So it's already a nearly $2,000 uh, repair, like maintenance and repair bill. But at 60,000 kilometers in a GL, what also would go? Front and rear brakes. What would also go? Front and rear tires. Mostly rears, but because it was um, uh, GLs are staggered, you'd have rear tires completely bald, usually at 58,000 kilometers because they don't rotate, right? Yeah. And well, secondly, the front would usually scrub yeah. because the fronts would usually be scrubbed, almost always be scrubbed because of the way they drive. Usually at a buck 60, going down the highway in the left-hand line, left-hand lane with the steering wheel cranked to try and hold it straight. So once that happens, you're now tires all around, which are like six or $700 a piece. You've got brakes all around, which is pads are like $300 per set, maybe $400 per set. You've got $300 per, uh, per rotor. So you're into four grand on top of basic maintenance. So now you're sixty five, seventy five hundred dollars. Just traded it in. Just traded it. Plus, more than likely, at, <laughs> at just shy of sixty thousand kilometers, they haven't been bringing it in because they knew they were coming in for the service. More than likely, the check engine lights on, so it was a DEF tank because they oh, were bad really? for that. Ugh. Under warranty, right? 
Then they'd yeah. have uh, something else wrong, like the speaker doesn't work, or the sunroof doesn't seal right, or this door doesn't close right, or the check engine light's on and it's not just a DF tank and it's something else because they were usually a diesel. So a tech would make two days worth of hours on that one truck. And that one truck total bill would be anywhere from eight to $10,000 between when you mix CP and warranty by the time so, it was all said. And, done. and these are leased vehicles and the people are doing all right. That's crazy. So what they would do that, Holy smokes. <laughs> so what they would all do is I'm not going to pay for that. Um, can I have the next one? Okay. Yeah. So they drive them in. They'd get the phone call to say it was $7,500. It's like, hey, uh, no, no, no. And then they call up the salesman. And say, hey, do you have a GL on the lot? Yep. Uh, is it this? Yep. Okay. I'll come and pick it up tomorrow. And they could pick up and they instead of leaving, leaving with the old one, they'll leave with the new one the next day. <laughs> See, incredible. <laughs> but then, now the cool thing is, yeah. there's, there's another cool thing that Mercedes does that the rest of the population is just kind of getting into. Mercedes has been doing this forever. If you sell a service contract, all of that maintenance is covered under the service contract. So the dealer doesn't have to incur the cost of all of that maintenance that goes in there. Two, if it's a leased vehicle, Mercedes is very, 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 very good at getting the uh, uh, wear package insurance as part of the payment. So guess what? The dealership also doesn't have to incur any of the tire pro any of the tire cost because the tire wear is an insurance. That's crazy. Two, That's so cool. the wear insurance also comes off for the brake, so they don't have to incur any of that cost either. So now they've warranty repaired the check engine light, the DEF tank. They've insurance costed all of the uh, wear repairs, the tires and the brakes and, and whatnot. And the service contract covered all the maintenance. So now they have a just under warranty. So a 60,000 kilometer, three-year-old Mercedes-Benz GL, which has been in pristine condition because it's regularly washed because they almost always are fresh on the lot. And the and dealer didn't have to pay a dime. That is such a good idea. Mercedes Benz has been around forever, but so they've they've gotten to figure it out. But wow, and those techs are probably pretty. Ford's happy been too. around longer. Well, that's <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. Euro, Euro. domestic. <laughs> I'm just saying that. Yeah. When yeah. we as leaders think about how to make it easy every step of the way. So that we can make the life easy for not only the guest, but also the dealer, the technician, the salespeople, the warranty people. We, how can we make this easy for them? How can we make it easy for them to make money? Because in reality, the easier it is to make money, the easier it is to make more money. Because there's a, a tiered approach to this too. Because as a Mercedes-Benz corporate employee... I got access to what they called a VEP program. Now, this is a corporate level program. There was a lot, all of the dealers across Canada participated, which means all of Mercedes Benz uh, um, employees like myself participated. I got access to a brand new Mercedes, anything in the fleet. Now, they had very specific models that you could, you could buy, but it was a 12 month lease, effectively 12 months or 12,000 kilometers, whichever came first. You couldn't go over, you absolutely could not go over, absolutely could not go over. Probably. And you had to be, had to be in and had to give it back at a certain time range. Okay. I got a B class for my wife at the time. I think it was 2014, again, 2013, 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. B class, brand new B250 for my wife to drive. Dang. I haven't driven a Benz. Uh, I've, I'd never driven a Benz at that stage. And I haven't driven another Benz since I left Mercedes Benz corporate, but I got a brand new B250 at the time for $250 a month. <laughs> that was payment. Heck yeah. That was insurance. Yeah. That was maintenance insurance, and I didn't have to fix it. Just drop it off at the dealer. <laughs> They'll take That's care it. of it. That sounds so, incredible. She drove that for nine months, rolled the 10 or 11,000 kilometers, and she did it twice. She had two of them, and I paid $250 a month for that. Good for you. Wow. That's incredible. The secondary, the second, there's a secondary benefit here, and this is the thing that this is the huge thing. The reason why Mercedes Benz here in Canada, the reason why the aftermarket values of those the the resale values is so high, because they determine the actual quantity of used cars out there. How do they do that? All of the VEP pro think about this. All of the VEP cars, so all of the staff that have now driven all of the Benzes are now sitting on the lot pristine as executive leases. So they're tiered. They're right 
They're tiered. Oh, so now Mercedes-Benz cool. corporate has written off the devaluation between the, the retail value and the, the lease value. They've written it off. That's a taxable thing that they've written off. Two, they now have a vehicle that, yes, it has 10,000 kilometers on it, but the first service is done and paid for. I paid for it. As the staff member, I effectively paid for it. So somebody else paid for the taxes. Taxes just gets written off. Sorry, the, the, the drop in value has been written off by taxes. I paid for the service, and now they have a prime used car so that somebody out there in the world who wants to get into a slightly lower dollar value but brand new Benz for the first time can now get into one very inexpensively in, in compared to everything else, and it's on a Mercedes lot, not off the off-site. Because they keep it on there. Yeah, that, the whole way they go about that is incredible. The team that thought about that deserves a raise, I think. What do you think? <laughs> they were time. thinking. Oh, Big wait. time. That is so cool. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. man. So, it, you probably had a lot of fun working at Mercedes Corporate then, I would imagine. I had a lot of fun working at Mercedes Cor Corporate with for a lot of reasons, but unfortunately, um, the thing about working at any corporate entity is that it's a corporate entity. So there's a lot of people working there. And even though I was working in a store and I worked in, in two different stores, there's a corporate mentality. I'm not very corporate. As you can tell, I'm, I'm not very corporate. So I have difficulty in certain things, in certain areas. Bureaucracy isn't one of my strong points. Um, I would much rather be direct and to the point. And unfortunately, certain things have to go through certain channels. And certain ways of communication isn't necessarily my best way of communicating, which is what I'm trying to get a lot better at, which is also why I'm trying to teach what I know to this point, because I might be a lot better at what I can do now than most of the mechanics that I talk to through in coaching. Let me get them to at least up to where I am so we can all be better. Because in reality, the things that I know at this stage is a hell of a lot more than you need to know to talk to a customer on a regular basis. Because bureau bureaucracy is a completely different ball of wax. Yeah. Being a professional and talking professionally to your peers and to customers is completely different than it is being professional at a bureaucratic level. Completely different. Completely different. That's a cool set of right? skills that you got to kind of learn and work with, though. You know, mm -hmm. you probably apply to it's, other things. It's really cool. I, I like being able to reflect back on it now because a couple of years ago, I had a hard time thinking of it like, I've had a lot of jobs. If I, if I was being self-reflective a couple of years back, looking at, it's like my resume sucks. I worked at a lot of places, but now I look, look back and I've worked at a lot of places. I have, I'm not like the three month guy though. You've been there I've for a while. Lot, I've, I've been there for long enough to get like 70, 75, 80% of the stuff that I really need to, to learn and move on. Life changes, shit happens. But the cool thing is I've got diversity in the fact that I've worked for, I worked for on the bench for a long time and I've worked diversely enough on the bench as it were to get a lot of different perspective. And, and I've also sat in the big chair and I've sat in the big chair for long enough to get a really good idea of what it's truly like, like guys, and I'm talking a whole lot here. I shouldn't be talking nearly as much. It should be you talking a whole no, bunch. No, it's but, okay. I've, I've been asking some questions that I, I personally as a listener wanted to, to, to get from you too. So the big chair. The big scary. chair is really scary. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I, and I look at you know, the people that have been in the in the chair, and unfortunately for our store, it's been a lot of people. But it's like, what do you do on a daily basis? What, what? Obviously, you have a lot of stuff going on, and I guess not a lot of people in the store know exactly what is on the docket every single day you walk in the door. So no, I. One of the things I would say. Looking back on, on the successes and failures while I was in, in some of the chairs I was in, having a plan, at least having a rough guide of plan of what's going to happen today will make you 10 times more successful than any other tool, process, tip, trick, whatever you can possibly learn. That If you do not have even a loose guideline and written for what your day is when you're sitting in those chairs, you're not going to be successful. You're just, you're not going to be successful. And the reason being is things can change so fast within the day, whether it's crisis management, whether it's random meetings, whether it's people that like to talk that you're trying to appease from a customer standpoint, 
things can get away from you so fast in terms of time that you just lose all sight of, of the goals that you have for the day. So one of the things that almost all of the great leaders that I've talked to that sit in those chairs, whether it's service manager, service director, fixed ops director, or GM, all of them have a plan for the day. And all of them that are successful, write it. You know what's cool? All you know what I think? Not only do they write it, but they share it with the people they work with. So you, yep. like we have a shop meeting at 11 o'clock every morning. We missed the one at this Monday and it was 11 o'clock and I made, I was making fun of because our, one of our service managers was off the guy that kind of leads it. And I looked at uh, one of the techs next to me. I'm like, where's our shop meeting? You know, like that's where we like go over, like, this is, this is how we did last week. This is our goal for this week. You know, we need this many hours, you know, this is how everybody's doing. These are the big projects in the shop. You need the, the, the come together, the morale booster to be like, Hey, this is where you guys are doing great. And that we, we can do mm -hmm. better. And this is what you guys can do better on. And it's nice to have a goal going into each week. So, and I appreciate Joe for doing that. Cause he, he brought that weekly or that daily meeting in and it's been incredible. So it, the, the thing about building that, that team atmosphere is consistently doing the thing that helps everyone. And when you first start them, it's awful. Everybody's like, dude, why are we going up to this meeting? Like, blah, blah, exactly. blah. could have put this in an email or whatever. Yeah. Everybody's kind of belly aching all the way up there. And it happens. I know exactly. he knows it's happening. So, but, and at a certain point, as long as the right questions are being asked of everyone, what do you need to be successful? I love that he asked that question and it is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and we, there's been so many more tools that are in the shop. Uh, something stupid as a sticker machine closer to us, you know, so we have to walk all the way across the shop for a sticker for a maintenance, uh, bumper racks, you know, let's, let's put parts. a pin in that one. Let's put a, put a really important pin in that one. Four steps is one second. That's crazy Every to think about. <laughs> four steps is one second. That's wild. So, how many seconds? Let me let me do the quick math because I, I have to do it every time because sometimes I'm an idiot. So um, so every 240 steps is a minute. Yeah. If you're so walking. when you look, <laughs> when you look at your 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 step counter on your on your on your watch on your Apple Watch or whatever your step counter is or however your step counter is, every 240 steps is a minute. So every time you can reduce the number of steps in your day, you are being more productive. And as mechanics, like we talked about earlier, doing the boring stuff is what makes us money. Yep. And when you look at the boring data, it's going to make you more money than anything else. So when you think, okay, this is why I moved, I moved my toolbox a foot closer to, to my bay than everybody else was. Everybody had their boxes right up against the, the, the wall. I moved mine a foot closer to me. So it was a foot off the wall, a full foot. That meant I last made one less step every time I went to my toolbox. The way that you, you have everything that. just uh, car, car, car pen, uh, I've, I've, I forgot the word that I'm looking for, but you like, you took a Excel spreadsheet and you put everything on there just to make yourself mm -hmm. faster. Like, that's awesome. It almost makes me want to do that tomorrow just to like start it. I mean, I have a work computer, just sit there and type Play it with in it. and see what happens, Play with you it. know? Because there is a line... Everybody's a little bit different. I'm a data nerd. That's, I really enjoy doing, not only is it going to make me faster, make me more money, but I really enjoy doing the actual act of the spreadsheet. There's going to be a lot of people that don't. That's okay. That's why I start, where's, where's my journal? That's why you start with here. Journal. It's what I teach in coaching. Journal, 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 journal. If you don't know, write it down. If you, if you don't know if you should write it down, write it down anyway. Because you're probably going to forget matter. it, right? At the end of the day. Because <laughs> I, right? I got to remember that, and then it there are, right out. There are so many things that you can track. You can overwhelm yourself with things to track. But as a mechanic, until you start tracking things yourself, properly tracking things yourself, you're not going to get any better. Because those weekly RTH reports, whatever you want to call them, they're only going to do so much. If you don't do anything with them, if you just put them in your toolbox, all it is is a record. It serves no value if you do nothing with them. But if you look at that RTH every day, every week, and you track it. Okay, what does this mean? Okay, I did a, and we were talking about it earlier. We've, we've got a fuel line recall on Tundras with a, 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 you got to drop the tank. Okay, how, 
Where's the work order where I did the first one? Okay, 2.1, 2.1, 2.0, 1.9, 1.9, 1.8, As you track it, guess what? There's a, a whole bunch of things that happens when you start tracking things like that. When they say, you know, if you, if you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. Yes, cliche. But guess what happens when you start tracking shit like that? Every time you beat your time is a win. One of the biggest challenges we have in mechanics, and the whole secondary reason why I'm doing this as wrench turners, is we are number three professions on the suicide scale. Yeah, which is super In 2016, there was 348 mechanics that took their own life. That's why I'm doing this. That's the shock and awe moment. 348 mechanics took their own life in 2016. And okay? I do appreciate you reaching out to specific people. Um, I guess not even, it's just the whole community as a whole to talk about things like that because people do show up to work. Yeah. You have stuff going on at home, but then when you're having a shitty day at work, because nothing's going right either, you almost want to have that buddy next to you to kind of be like, Hey, what's going on? You know? And that's mm -hmm. a team atmosphere. And I can start to mm -hmm. see that coming back into the, um, into the trade, which is nice. So, and, and that's what the data does. When you write those things down, for and, and this is where the, this is the thing that you folks really need to understand here for a second. And this is this is I love this. Data can bring you happiness, and the reason why I say that is, look at it from a pure self-centered, egotistical point of view. No one cares about you. No one's coming to save you. No one's going to be there when you fall. Think about it that way. That's an awful way to think. That's a depression, depressive way to think. That's stressful. That's anxiety inducing. That is suicide inducing that. But if you understand that that's the case, you have to start doing things for yourself. So when you start tracking things and you can see the little wins and you can see how many little wins you do every single day, you don't need anybody else's validation. You don't need anybody else's help to be better. You can become better yourself. And it's the little, tiny, insignificant things. It's the thousand golden BBs, not the silver bullet that fixes that shit. Yeah. Right? You look at your day. How many big pieces of shit do we have to deal with in a day? That's a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Lots. Just thinking, really big, yeah. gargantuan, I just went to Taco Bell kinds of shits. But guess what? When you look across your day, how many micro wins did you have across a day? Did you break your pick when you used it? inappropriately prying something out. No, that's a win. That is a big win. <laughs> that's a big win. You didn't stab right? your finger with it. <laughs> you didn't stab your finger with it. Or you did stab your finger with it and you did have a Band-Aid on your toolbox. So you didn't have to go get it from the, from, the, from the first aid kit. So you didn't have to walk across the shop. You just put a Band-Aid on it and went and go. Or the, the electrical tape was on the top of your toolbox. So you just that, wrapped it up and it was right there. That works there. good too. Right? But it's the little wins. If you don't write the little wins down, it's really hard to remember all the wins that you've had. So if you start writing the little wins down and you don't necessarily have to write them down because you're getting those reports every day. So you circle the wins. Look at, look, yesterday I had, I worked on 10 different cars yesterday and I made money on all of them. Look, I, I made, I made 10 hours. That's awesome. I made 10 hours yesterday. That's awesome. I get to work today and I get to do it again tomorrow. And I made 10 hours. And not only did I make 10 hours, I'm was, uh, efficient by 15% yesterday. So I only worked like nine hours and I made 10. That's awesome. And when you go to the days where you don't make any money, quote unquote, don't make any money where you work eight and a half and you make eight, look at the, the RTH because I'm willing to bet several of the lines on that R RTH day, you still were productive on. Yep. You probably only took a dump on one. And that, that's really all it takes. But if you go back, your productivity on the other days is going to make up for that. So it's one bad day isn't going to make or break your week, even if it's the Monday, you know? Right. So don't look at the day. Don't look at the week. Don't even look at the month. Maybe start really gauging things on a quarter. But if you look at the day, you're just going to lose every time because every day is such a struggle. It's all struggle every day because you're learning something every day. You are a difficult customer, difficult conversation doesn't matter what it is every day is a struggle that's life that's just that's what that it is so you gotta find the little wins and all the little bits that you do one other thing that i would like to say too is the just because you have the master tech title doesn't mean you're done learning you're gonna get hit with shit you're gonna get hit with all of it 
it's Fuck that, every please. single day you're yeah. going to learn something new. And that's the one thing that uh, I think a lot of like loop techs and semi skills and apprentices, they're like, I can't wait to be that master tech. You're, you're not going to know everything. You're still going to be learning every single day. There's guys that have been there for 25 years that are still learning every single day. So it never goes away. Every day. Every, every day. day. And you should be learning every day, even once you've got your master tech and you've like, uh, there's been a couple of folks. If you go back uh, a couple of episodes, folks, and you listen to all the mechanics that, you know, the shop foreman, the, the, the folks that have been in the trade for a long time, they're still learning yep. just because you've got the master tech on there, master MDT, whatever the, whatever the nomenclature your brand uses to say that you are complete training doesn't mean dick. doesn't mean shit because guess what that is foundational knowledge yep nothing beats experience hands down bar none because it doesn't matter how much education and training you have experience tops them all because just like your example where this is this works this works your field tech says this your field tech says and it still potentially didn't fix the car guess what you've got master techs you've got engineers you've got all of the information and you still had something wrong because experience hadn't taught you the right answer yet it's a new make and model and that's exactly it You're, it's nobody's seen that car long enough it's been out for what two years now not even so mm -hmm. they're still learning it too yeah they created it but they didn't they have no idea what's going to be going on with that car yet either so everybody's learning yeah once you once you learn that it makes the job a lot easier so yeah i do like that 100 yeah well jake this has been a blast yeah, thank this you for blast, having bro. me on. As long as you have, I appreciate that. It's I. I you are I, very welcome. <laughs> it was nice to learn more about your past and everything that you've done. And uh, if there's one thing that I could end on, because I know you wanted me to give some advice to some of the other texts, if, is there anything that you were willing to give me to leave with, like a parting gift, like some advice that could possibly help me later on in life with my job? Journal. Okay. Sounds there, good. This is the single most powerful tool in your arsenal. The single most powerful tool in your arsenal. There is nothing that I can teach you. There is nothing anyone can teach you that is more powerful than that journal because you will write something down tomorrow and it will be of no consequence to you tomorrow, next year, or in a decade. But in 15 years time, when you are a legend in the trade and somebody asks you a question and you go, I know exactly what the answer to that is. And you pull out a journal from 2024 in May and you opened up the page that you remember in 2024 May and you go work order 321556 line three, uh, 2021 FJ Cruiser. Uh, fault code, uh, diagnostic, uh, repair vent valve. And you can pull that out. That will be the thing that go and the bells will go off in your head and you will be able to go through all the things in your head that you did on that repair. And then you can teach that person all the things on there. So that is idea. more powerful than anything I can give you. And the second tool is the removing the negative. This thing, if you're having any challenges of any kind, it doesn't matter what it is. You can fix anything with journaling. And the reason I say that is whatever the thing it is that you want to fix isn't the thing that you want to fix. There is something else at play. But the only way to figure out what the other thing at play is, is to journal. I'll give you an example. So uh, one of the examples in the coach's corner is roughly, and this is going to be loose because it's now been a year and a half since I had that session with him. But being this technician was down on themselves. They wanted to find a new job because the boss sucked and the store sucked and this sucked and everything sucks and life sucks and this sucks. I'm not making enough money and da 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 da. The making the money wasn't the problem. It is, but it wasn't the problem. The boss sucking is a problem, but it wasn't the problem. All of the ancillary bits that were going on around him wasn't necessarily the problem. The problem was the complaining about all of the things. In order to figure that out, I had to get him to journal every time he made a complaint. Anytime that you complained about your baymate, write down your date and time 
So you're complaining about your playmate and why? You have a complaint about your boss, write down the date and time you're complaining about your boss. Anytime you had a complaint about parts, write down the date and time you were talking about your parts. Whatever the complaint was, I don't care. I want to know what, and I disguise it as I want to know what the complaints are so we can figure out what the complaints are so we can get the other things fixed. Yeah. I knew that the complaint was the problem. So at the end of a week, we had, I don't even remember what the number was. It was some astronomical number. It was like 85 or 90 things written down in the journal over the cross of five days that he was complaining about. It's okay. You had to take a little extra time to write it down. But you complained 90 times in five days. Who's the problem? That, that is a little tough. <laughs> Which was a great way to disguise it, too. That is awesome. <laughs> right? So, yes, all of the things that he written, all of them had some merit to them. There was some merit to them. They had a brand new parts person on the back counter who didn't know shit from shit and had no desire to learn from shit from shit. They were an awful person. Just a fact. So it's a difficulty dealing with every day. But guess what? You can't control them, and they are still the parts person, and you still need to get parts from them. So we need to figure out how to communicate with them to get what you need to be successful. Yep. That was part of the coaching down the road. Second thing, Baymate. Constantly complaining about the Baymate getting gravy. Was there merit to that? Absolutely. There was two things. One, the Baymate was an asshole. Truly was. Just an asshole. But he was also getting all the gravy. Why? Talk to dispatcher. Guy complaining all the time. His dispatching codes were incorrect. He was not technically set up properly. He had zero. Uh, how did he phrase it? He had zero C skill. Um, um, I can't remember. I want to say the right word right here, but I'm completely missing at the point. Point being is all of the gravy work job skills that needed to be in the in the DMS to make sure he could also get that stuff it wasn't, wasn't there. there. Uh, so then you're Just screwing yourself right there. There. Yeah. So. No matter how many times he located to the next job, he was never going to get gravy unless no one else was available. He was going to get the hardest job on the list that was next on the list, period. So he's getting all the shit because he couldn't physically get the gravy. That changed. So the time offset. So now his baymate was still getting lots of gravy, but he was also getting some gravy now and then. So that started to offset. So now we fixed three things outside of his purview. But now the secondary point is we flat we've based we've baselined the number of times you've complained in a week now the point is next week we can't have 90 whatever the number was i don't remember it's in it's in one of the episodes but functionally it's 90 so next week it can't be 90 whatever it is i don't care if it's 89 next week but it can't be 90 so over the course of a period of time it's getting it down Redu remove the negative you feel like you're going to complain about something go for a walk don't complain go for a walk take a breath I don't care what you do. I'll give you all kinds of different things that I can help you do to try and get better. But don't complain. Don't bitch. Don't whine. Don't complain. Don't moan. Go for a walk. So instead of writing down a complaint, he's writing down, went, went for a walk, breathe, something else. So take that 90 complaints down every week to something else. So by the time, I think 12 weeks rolled around, I think we were down to like 20, maybe 15, right? Something like that, that things that he can control. And guess what happened at the end of 12 weeks? He made 15% more. Week over week, he was making 15% more. That's incredible. Zero, like, didn't have to ask for a raise, didn't have to move, didn't have to change jobs, didn't have to go look for another job. It's just what you can control. And it's all from journaling. That is a good idea. I appreciate that. That's, I'm going to so, start doing that. Because, yeah, there's days where you, you want to complain. So, and that might be a good idea to just kind of, you know, take a walk think about what, it's, what it, it was everybody in the shop should do it and if, if you don't want to journal so that's the that's the journal is technically the harder of the thing that i that i teach the other one's the counter um if you want to be really simple we all usually have stainless steel benches which means just um, a permanent marker wipes off of them with ray clean so get at a permanent marker every time you want to complain just mark it on the on on the stainless steel counter and at the end of the day put it in the journal how many times you've done it instead of journaling like you don't have to write out, don't write out the thing to save the, to save the time, but you've put a, put a notch on your belt, put a notch on the, on the counter, something somewhere or a grease board, whatever, just, I'm going to complain. So there's a number. And at the end of the day, write down the number in the journal. So that's an easy thing to write down. So Monday, January 5th, Tuesday, January 6th, five, six, seven, whatever. And then total at the end of the week, super simple. And then what you're doing is your 
you're combating subjective with objective, right? Now you have a tactical objective number that you can track as an individual to hold yourself accountable to whatever it is. And in most of the time it's behavior, right? The second, like give you another example. Um, when you write stuff down like that, things like your number of steps in a day, how many times do you have to go to parts? Like if you have to go to parts 10 times a day, how many steps is it to parts? Is it 40 steps? Well, that's 10 seconds, right? If it's, if it's 10 seconds there, 10 seconds back, 20 seconds. How many times do you have to do that in a day and do the math? That means X number of dollars is going out the door by you working to, walking to, walking to parts. How can you save that? Well, one, you can see, okay, if there's 25 guys in the shop and all of them have roughly the same walk that you do, well, the end of the week, that totals, if that totals $600 in productivity, you go say, hey, boss man, $600 a week, you're going to save, you hire us a parts runner. Hey, that's, <laughs> you're training me to think in a different way, which is really cool. That's it's like, it's that's... like, yeah, it's things you never yes. really think about. Yeah. Walking to parts, whatever, everybody's got to do it. But like, yeah, you cut down on that time. That is incredible. <laughs> when you start to wrap your head around removing subjective from everything. And as Jocko was says, you know, extreme accountability, everything is my fault. Bad and good. Everything is my fault. And you take the subjective out of everything and make everything objective. How can I take fewer steps? How can I take fewer movements? How can I use fewer tools? How can I take fewer steps in this repair procedure? Flat rate mentality, everything. Take the subjective out. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how awful it is. I don't care how difficult and challenging talking to a customer is. Flat rate mentality, everything. And you win big. And then you can, you can apply it to everything. Like, like that example, you know, if you've got 25 guys and it totals $600 in a, in a week that you would save, all of a sudden that's freed up money for your boss to go out and hire the person that they really wanted to hire anyway, right? They were looking for a reason to hire somebody because now instead of just doing parts running, maybe he does parts running half the time, but maybe they also do, maybe they're also a porter. Maybe they're also running the shuttle. Maybe they're also doing other things. And now they double and triple up on their value, right? That's how as mid-level leaders, which is what a shop foreman is, save the company money and, and make it money all the same. You, you, you find the granular things, take it, throw out the subjective and do the objective thing. That's so cool to think about it that way. Good stuff. Cool. I appreciate your insight. That's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. I think that's a, that's a great tidbit to leave on today, yeah. folks. Cause I think, uh, uh, I think it's been a, oh, Jesus, we got an hour and 40, hour and 40. Jesus, we got an hour and 40 yeah. in here. We've been going. Okay, folks, this is going to be a long one. Uh, y'all, you're going to, oh my goodness, folks, that's at the end of another episode. I hope you guys enjoy and I hope you guys subscribe to that because there's so many nuggets in there from Jake. Oh my goodness, that's so many good stuff in there. I appreciate every single one of you that have bought the merch. I'm really, really thankful uh, that it's going over well. My mom is thankful as well. Uh, she keeps saying it. It's comfy. She wears it. She sent me another picture of her wearing her, her sweater. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. We've got a quote as we always do. And I think this is a really good one for today because it's very poignant for here today. And I didn't even know that we were going to get into this, but we did. That's cool. It's I'm amazing. It. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Harry S. Truman. Folks, remember negative pushes, positive pulls. And always clean your toys before you put them away.